want to say that this is uh, one of the most important gatherings one could imagine uh, in the College of Engineering at Purdue. Uh, as you know, that uh, getting tenure at Purdue Engineering requires very high bar uh, in many ways. Uh, and we want to congratulate publicly uh, those colleagues who made it and also ask them to share with all of us, including some PhD students and postdocs and colleagues, uh, what they did and what difference did those wonderful work make uh, in uh, research, but also in learning and in engagement and impact to society. And this is the third uh, of this semester's Celebrate Associate Professor series on uh, Arvin, who really is the architect along with his wonderful office behind the series uh, is traveling today. So uh, that's why you get a substitute like me. Uh, and I want to thank Arvin and his team for doing this. Um, and uh, today I think we're gonna celebrate uh, Abigail and Amy uh, and listen to their stories. Uh, if you see me exiting like before 12 o'clock just because I have another engagement, uh, had nothing to do with uh, your content. And uh, we're eagerly looking forward to learning from these two now tenured uh, faculty colleagues. Uh, and before I hand it over uh, to uh, the two heads uh, of the schools and divisions uh, to which Abigail uh, belong, I want to uh, highlight uh, what tenure means. It means a lot of different things to different people. To me, it meant, you know, I got a whole year devoted to child care of our first uh, daughter. Uh, and while my wife was uh, at medical residency, uh, so to me, tenure meant a lot of diaper changes uh, and like uh, a dip in productivity in other dimensions for a year or two. Uh, but it was the happiest year I ever had in my life. Uh, and uh, to others, it meant that you know I get to uh, imagine things outside of the box. I get to uh, write a proposal that is risky and may not be funded. I get to uh, maybe teach online. Uh, Maybe I get to finish uh, that textbook. Maybe I get to uh, think about uh, a patent and invention, a startup companies. Maybe I get to just pivot to a whole new field. Well, you are free to do whatever you want to do. Uh, and that is the, a true unique beauty about at least American academia enterprises. Uh, once tenured, you can retire or you can dream, uh, please do not take that as a recommendation, uh, you, can, you can dream really big. Uh, and we know that here at Purdue Engineering, all those who get tenured, you know, after the champagne and celebration with family and friends, and say, yes, now what can I do? Uh, and what can I dream? Things that I try not to think too much about pre-tenure. So this is the most fantastic thing uh, a faculty can have is to now sit down and think really big. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to introduce Abigail's uh, school heads, uh, Nate uh, from ABE and John from Triple E. Thank you. So, hello, I'm Nate Mosier, and I'm the interim head of agricultural and biological engineering. It's my pleasure to uh, begin the introduction of Abigail Abby Engelberth uh, uh, to our program. So she uh, will talk about her research here in a few moments. Uh, she has been a uh, great asset to our program across all three missions of the land grant uh, mission of a university like Purdue. Uh, she's very active in teaching at the undergraduate and the development of a, of a critical undergraduate hands-on practical laboratory learning experience and uh, spearheaded the development of some practical, hands-on, professional development and leadership opportunities for our graduate students in their education as well, in addition to the research she's going to speak about in a moment. Uh, she's also actively engaged in uh, industry collaboration and outreach and is a, an important member of the Laboratory of Renewable Resources Engineering here at Purdue University as well. And so with that, uh, I uh, please introduce John Sutherland, uh, the head of Triple E. All right, thank you, Nate. Um, my name is John Sutherland. I'm head of environmental ecological engineering. We always say Triple E. So um, it's really a, a 
fantastic pleasure to help introduce Abby. She is one of the charter members of the Triple E faculty. In fact, she was one of the first people that Triple E hired, uh, and it doesn't seem that long ago, but I, I guess it's you know six, seven years. Um, she is uh, a fantastic and inspirational teacher. She's been uh, um, inspiring to so many students. I've seen her teach. She does an outstanding job. She helped kind of make the Triple E curriculum, build it out and make it all happen. I'm really excited about her research because we all know that the, um, the CO2 footprint for industry is in uh, large measure uh, driven by the, the use of, of non-renewable resources. And Abby's involved in working with renewable resources and making products from those. So um, I want to thank uh, ABE um, for working with us when we hired Abby. And uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Abigail Engelberth. All right. Well, thank you, John, Nate, and Mong. You know you're important when you get three people to introduce you, right? Um, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to come talk today. I'm very excited. Um, as you can see from me, value-added recovery is on the horizon. It was very obvious to me. My husband was like, what is that last night? So that's my little play. Um, I'm learning now that, that Twitter actually has some um, academic sustenance. So if you are so inclined, please tweet this out. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about what I have been working on um, uh, towards the tenure process and what I kind of see as the, some of the future um, projects. So a little bit about my path. I actually started in 2011, so eight years ago, which doesn't seem possible. But I started at the end. I started in November of 2011, so it doesn't really count. Um, you know, there was the holidays in there and all that stuff. So it just was kind of me getting to know campus for two months. Um, but then I started working on the whole tenure process. And the first part was, what on earth am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing? How do I do this? Um, so it took some figuring out how to get students, how to establish the lab, how to um, mentor students, how to realize that they weren't all little versions of me and that they're all in, uh, independent people with their own thoughts and um, uh, opinions. So how do I work with them and how do I um, manage and make sure that they are, can be successful? And I've had a number of projects along the way. And I'll talk about a few selected projects. Um, we don't have the time for me to talk about all of them. Um, but once I was a little more established, I, you know, I, I kind of got what I'm doing. I understood it. I was able to go after some projects that were a little more um, a little bigger. So, um, and then finally, um, as a last push to tenure, I able to get on some even bigger projects and kind of decide where I wanted to go. And then as I'm looking towards the future, I'm looking more at things that are like, like Monk said, a little more risky, a little more um, exciting. So not just kind of every opportunity out there, but kind of taking a little bit of time to refocus and figure out what exactly opportunities are going to be the most fruitful and the most impactful and potentially the most interesting to me. So my research goal along the way has been to for value-added product recovery. So that involves finding a product. So what is the product of interest? How do we get at it? And then how much value can it add? Um, and this has not happened with every single project. Um, the techno-economic analysis is a portion of my research that often gets put on the back burner. Uh, but I find it to be very exciting because it lets you know what the value-added product could be worth. Um, but it's really hard to do on a proof of concept. So sometimes projects have to be a little more mature before you can add in an economic component. Um, a common target that I often go after is something that is eliminated or discarded material or substance or a byproduct that is no longer useful. So what I'm talking about is waste. So looking at wasted products or underutilized products, so low value streams. How do we convert those into something of higher value and recover something useful out of them? So give them a, a life beyond what they had. Um, Conventional wastes are things we think about, you know, garbage, things that go to the landfill, human waste, animal waste, things like that. But I'm going after what's called, or I'm thinking of as more unconventional wastes. So there's 
both kind of food waste, so these are industrial food process waste, so spent coffee grounds have a lot of nitrogen and oils still within them that you could extract and use. Uh, cacao pods contain um, antioxidant properties along with avocado skins, which also contain carotenoids. Um, ag residues such as bagasse, corn stover, and rice hulls have a lot of utility left in them, but they're not necessarily used to their best value, and this is not like the best way for everyone to see this. Um, but bagasse and corn stover are often used in the lignocellulosic biorefinery to create ethanol and other products of that nature. And then rice holes contain a lot of silica uh, that can be used for silicon nanoparticles, lithium ion batteries, things of that nature. Now, while I don't necessarily work on all of these, these are the types of things that I go after, these kind of high, val or high volume, low value product streams. And I just really like this because I want to point out that I've actually been at this for a while. This is the cover letter for my application to graduate school in 2003, 2004. I wasn't smart enough to put a date on it, apparently. <laughs> um, but this was when I was applying to my master's program at Iowa State. And I said that I would like to study how to separate a product out of a waste stream and use uh, it to fuel the manufacture of other products. Well, that was pretty uh, insightful for, what, 22-year-old me? So way to go. I figured it out right away. Uh, but I just like to show this because it really shows that I've kind of been on this path for a while, and it's something that I'm really passionate about. Now, when I started out, I was really looking at mm, biorenewable resources, so kind of the, the ag residues and the, the biorefinery co-products. I've expanded this a little bit more to look at other waste streams as well, so food waste, um, uh, using uh, 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 soybean oil for a higher value product. So not just biorefinery wastes, but other products as well. So I've kind of expanded that. So in traditional uh, processing, you have some type of feedstock that you make into a major product. Along that way, you can take some portion of it, do another side um, reaction or, or side stream, and have a value added product as well. So that's a lot of what I do. Um, not, and, and now it's much more beyond just the biomass area and looking into other waste streams and other sources of carbon. So I want to talk to you about I've some selected accomplishments. Like I said, if I had uh, talked about all of my accomplishments, we'd be here all day. <laughs> no one's got time for that. Um, one of my first projects that I did with my first PhD student was recovering acetic acid from corn ethanol. So the goal of this project was to improve the fermentation of corn stover ethanol by removing an inhibitor uh, via liquid-liquid extraction. So acetic acid is a ubiquitous inhibitor um, found in all, all lignocellulosic biomass, and it uh, reduces the amount of ethanol that can pe be produced. Um, we were able to demonstrate that we could remove acetic acid using ethyl acetate, uh, keep the sugar stream intact, and we were able to improve both the fermentation rate and yield. We threw our model into the National Renewable Energy Labs model um, in the Aspen process uh, uh, software, and we were able to run a techno-economic analysis, and we found by they just adding in our process that you could reduce the minimum ethanol selling price by about 35 cents per gallon. So by adding in this process to take out the acetic acid, we could improve uh, the uh, major product and recover an additional byproduct. I also worked on the recovery of lutein and zeaxanthin from DDGS, which is Dried Distillers Grains and Solubles. So many acronyms. Um, but there was evidence that DDGS contained lutein and zeaxanthin. Now, lutein and zeaxanthin are carotenoids, which are found often in the human eye, and they're found uh, to, the, the more you have, the, the better um, eye health you have, but you have to get them from your diet, so they're not things that you can make uh, within your body. Um, there was initial trials that found that if the chicken feed diet, if it were to be um, increased in the amount of DDGS fed to the chickens, that the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin in the yolk would increase. So that would lead us to believe that the amount of uh, lutein and zeaxanthin in the DDGS should be fairly significant. But there were no reports at the time as to how much was in, in there exactly. So we did some experiments and we found that the process to make DDGS, so the corn wet milling process, actually concentrates the lutein and zeaxanthin um, from where it is in the corn. 
Um, and this was very significant because this had not been reported yet. Um, but this also lets us know that DDGS is a viable alternative for lutein and zeaxanthin recovery. Um, many of you may have seen lutein and zeaxanthin on the shelf of your pharmacy. You can buy it, you can take it, you can help your own eyes um, on a regular basis. It's also added often to infant formula for uh, eye development. But the current source for lutein and zeaxanthin is marigold flower petals. So we were looking to see if potentially if there's a better way that we could get some of these uh, compounds. And then the last project I want to uh, touch on is recovering lactic acid from food waste. So this kind of started me into the research area of value recovery from food waste. So the goal of this project was to use food waste that was inoculated with primary sludge, so wastewater uh, sludge, to produce high quantity and quality of lactic acid. Now lactic acid can be used to produce polylactic acid, which is uh, used fairly regularly and commonly in 3D printing and other plastic applications. Um, and we were able to demonstrate that our um, inoculation scheme was able to produce up to 58 grams per liter of L-lactic acid, and L-lactic acid is the desired form of lactic acid to produce polylactic acid. Um, and we also determined that some non-controlled variables play a significant role in lactic acid production. And what I mean by that is that researchers were, were looking into this, but they were holding a lot of things not constant. So some researchers would get their uh, substrate, so their food waste, and they would freeze it, and then they would use it later. Some would get their food waste, they would not freeze it, and they would use it right away. Um, some would use continuous versus um, uh, intermittent pH control. I mean, we found that these factors actually played a really significant role on how much lactic acid is produced. So we published that as well, um, and it's been getting a lot of attention. Um, but what's next? What's on the horizon for me? I see a lot more going into the area of food waste. This is becoming a pretty significant problem in the US and globally. There's a lot of food that is discarded and it's not just food from your household. Um, though now whenever I see it, I'm always like, oh gosh, that's just waste. Um, but there's a lot of food waste that's produced in the industrial level. So these are things that are not edible anyways. So um, avocado skins, you're not gonna eat those and you shouldn't, um, but they're good sources of carbon. So can we somehow um, get those and make them into something higher value? Uh, this was from a publication I put out last year um, comparing uh, upgrading of some industrial food waste products using either anaerobic digestion, upgrading straight to methane to be put onto the electric power grid, or into some specialty products. Um, and this was, paper was also really interesting because within the past year alone, in 2019, it's gotten 17 citations, which I thought was really cool. But this was looking at how do we upgrade food waste and what are the, is the economic trade-offs between doing a low value, high volume product like methane or some more specialty product. I'm also working with a few researchers uh, across campus on closing the loop on food production. So looking at using food waste to power anaerobic digestion, to create carbon dioxide and methane, to power a vertical farming unit. Um, so how can we use uh, food waste from both the industry and potentially later on collect it from food service and households? Um, how do we, can we use all that and close the loop from um, <coughs> uh, other applications? Um, one of the interesting things about researching in waste is that there's not a lot of funding because waste is very low value. But recently, I think there's gotten to be a lot more interest in the area, which I think is really cool. And I've seen more calls from government agencies looking at specifically food waste and other waste as well. So I see a lot going in this area, which is why I'm excited that I've kind of set myself up um, to go more into this. In the end, what I'd like is to be able to sell my own little widget on Amazon too. Uh, so can I find a waste product, make it into something really cool that you want to buy, you know, potentially four at a time? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I thank you for your time, and I hope that was uh, helpful, and I'll have time for any questions. All right, thank you, Abby. We do have time for questions from the audience. Oh man, it was that good. <laughs> Thank 
you. Thank you for the presentation. So could you go back to the beautiful diagram you showed before? Are you focusing mostly on uh, b the one before? Please, yes. Are you focusing on the, the West from the industry alone or is there any way to improve or you can utilize the West that come from the household or because I think it pay a right. really big contribution. So initially we are focused on industrial food waste and that's for a few reasons. One, it's easier to collect and get after. Um, two, it's more homogenous, so you can do a little bit more with it. Um, and we've also had pushback. Some uh, uh, we submitted a proposal, and one of the reviewers thought that we were going after. It didn't say this anywhere, but they just got it in their head. But that we were going after household waste, which they said that we would then encourage people to waste more food, which is just silly. But that's there's a public perception within there. If we're going to do stuff with food waste, then it's fine if I don't eat it, or if it's fine then that if I don't use it. So I think there's a lot to do in that area. But I think getting to the household waste, it's going to take a while. Is there a regulation in U.S. how like household should dispose their waste, or you just put together on a trash can and then it's so? Good? My research has led me to create my own compost pile at my house. Um, after everything that I've done, I realized that I wasn't composting and that I really needed to be. So now I compost. It's mostly just coffee grounds, just in a bin. <laughs> but I think there's soil in there, right? There's lots of bugs and stuff. Um, it's just <laughs> emptying stuff into the compost is like so annoying. Um, but it's made me realize that that has to be done. In West Lafayette, at least, there is some anaerobic digestion that happens. So when you do put food down the drain and put it in your through your garbage disposal and it goes to the treatment plant, stuff does, good stuff happens with that. But when you throw it in the landfill, that's not great. Um, it then creates methane, CO2, all that from the landfill. Whereas that can be used, you can get that somewhere else and that would be better use. So if you can, community composting would be great. So Abby, uh, I'm Eckhart Grohl from Emmy. Uh, why are we so far behind in this in the US, right? If you're in Europe, especially in Germany, where I'm from, right, foods, uh, are the whole waste separation is a common, right. it's a must. You actually get fined mm -hmm. uh, by your local community if you don't wa uh, separate your waste and have everything that's compostable. Um, you know, uh, in a certain pile, and then only that what needs to go into the landfill really needs to go to the landfill. So um, <coughs> it takes a change of culture, but yep. how do we change this culture? I can tell you, I compost everything in my my right. home in my backyard. I just dump it, but anyway. Uh, yeah, maybe no, not the best way to do it. But. You're right. It's, it's going to take a cultural shift. And one thing I think that's really hard that people forget about the U.S. is we are a really big country. I mean, Germany, it's very small comparatively, right? So if you want to implement something there, it's almost in some ways easier to do because you're very small. But U.S. is very large, and we cover a lot of geographic uh, areas and a lot of different weather patterns, a lot of different cultures even within the U.S. Um, so I think that is a question to bring on some social scientists to help answer because I don't know how to change the culture. I think there's going to be a lot more education um, and required about why people should be um, treating their wastes a little differently um, and I'm not necessarily sure how to do that but I know doing some research and driving the economic value of waste in a different direction would be beneficial. There was a hand over here. Is there another question? It's for the live stream. Yeah, I had a question about how you mentioned that marigolds are currently the only source. Mm -hmm. Are there other sources that you have come across? Oh yeah, so a lot of the foods you eat contain um, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin. So most foods that are either yellow or orange in color contain it. So uh, uh, bell peppers are great sources, corn, um, other foods that are yellow that I can't think of right now, but also like kale and spinach. They have everything in it, so I think you're supposed to just eat a lot of that. Um, but it's not a great commercial source for that because those are also really high value foods. So we're not going to necessarily extract it from something like that. But marigolds, it's there. Um, and marigolds are pretty low value and easy to grow. Not necessarily easy to harvest um, for this type of application, but it's a high enough value product that it's done. Oh. Yes, Craig. Great job, Abby. Um, 
so it, you focus primarily on crops, but is there an animal processing component, animal byproduct component that you're also interested in? Yes, but I haven't gotten there yet. I've mostly worked on um, the, the plant matter. Uh, the animals are a whole different uh, ball game for me that I haven't gotten there yet. I decided not to go with the beast analogy, so. <laughs> Um, my question is uh, maybe a bit outside of your work, but okay. since you're working in a waste, uh, how do you see the U.S. projection or um, in the future after the Chinese recycling mm -hmm. um, 2018 stopping contract? How do you view the, the U.S. solution in the future? So I think that's going to have to be a cultural shift as well, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Uh, you're right, it is outside my scope. Uh, it's something I'm interested in just as a citizen of the planet, but I don't know how to solve that problem. Um, but I think we're gonna have to change how we interact with um, products that we no longer value as useful. And I don't know what that is, but it's something to definitely look forward to. All right, let's thank Abby one last time.